But just so you know, oh, amazing. It'll, it'll be live on my channels. So it's already amazing. live. It just went up right now. Yeah. When, yeah. Why don't you make sure you you got it right? Yeah. Yep. It's working. Amazing. Good Perfect. stuff. It is working. We're online. Let me just see where we are on YouTube. What's, your, what's the name of your channel on YouTube? It's, it's just your own book. Yeah, I'm on, we're on YouTube and I have to mute. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. So all of America, basically. US, Central, Latin, and some of Brazil, because we shared it across Latin America too. So we'll excellent, see excellent. who we have joining in. So do you, Recording do you, in progress. Is it is it the the um, let me just see let me just adjust the uh, the screen here. No worries. Whenever you're ready, I'll I'll kick us off here and we can start the the dialogue. After like an hour or so, we're gonna move over to questions from the general audience here too. Okay, just to we'll sure. obviously pre-select them and, and walk through them together. But we'll and, and are you streaming this on your platforms? Um, we're not streaming directly, it's but it's, it's open to the audience. So it was promoted to a large, you know, database of emails. It was Great. promoted on our, our social media channels. So we expect a, a relevant audience here. Great. Let me just. Uh, cool. Yep. Um, so I think to kick us off, we're already a minute over, and just to be respectful with time. So to start, for those of you that are in the U.S. or Latin America that don't know who I am, just to present myself, I'm going to be having this conversation with Yadam and Tomas. My name is Marcio Ramos. I'm the president of IFIARI São Paulo. Um, it's a large institute um, dev um, devoted to being a voice for individual freedom here in Brazil. And our mission is to develop young leadership under the principles of individual liberty, free market, um, private property, and the rule of law, right? Going back to the basics of John Locke and Bastia, that's our, our focus here. I'm also joined here by Tomas Botelho. He's one of our directors this year. Um, Tomas will be joining us for this conversation. Welcome, Tomas. And a big thank you to Yad, and I'll, I'll do an introduction here in a second here, so I'll jump over to you um, towards the end. Um, a quick acknowledgement to sponsors, so Editora LVM, Brasil Paralelo, Caravelas Custuria, Hayek Global College, Marque Bolos, Santec Coaching, Baker Chile, and Capital Social. And a quick acknowledgement to some of our friends here in Brazil that helped support us, Caio Perez, Danilo Costa, Davi Velis, Gabriel Kerner, Lucas Mota, Luiz Paulo Aranha, Paulo Gartner, Rodrigo Milan, Rodrigo Sankowski, and Tomás Magalhães. The list is growing, so it's going to get longer and harder to, to share over the years here. Um, for those of you that are with, with us, questions, um, please send them through the Q&A feature here in Zoom. Um, we'll be selecting them and sharing them with Yana towards the end here. Um, and please identify yourself so we know your name and we can sort of call on you if needed. Um, last topic here. So a quick introduction on, on Yana's bio and, and Yana, if I... If I have anything wrong here, please feel free to correct me. So um, Dr. Brook is the host of the Yaron Brook Show. Um, and he's a renowned lecturer on capitalism, politics, and econo economic freedom and freedom of speech, as well as, as also a philosopher and historian of the work and life of Ayn Rand. He is currently chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and serves on the board of the, of the Clemson Institute for the Study of Capitalism and is a member of the Associate of Private Enterprise Education and finally of Mount Pelerin Society. Um, Yaron, to kick us off, would you mind telling us a bit about your story in your own words and, and sort of how and when did you get in touch with, with liberal or like we say in the US, libertarian author, authors and ideas? Yeah, and we'll have to talk about libertarian, right? You know, because I don't identify myself quite as a libertarian. I actually like the word liberal better, but um, or at least a classical liberal, as we have to we have to say in the US, given that the, the left stole that word a long time ago from us. Exactly. Uh, but I was, I was born and raised in, uh, in Israel. And as almost everybody uh, who was uh, my generation in Israel, uh, I was very much raised under a, a socialist, collectivist, nationalist kind of atmosphere and environment. So I, in my teenage years, I was committed to all of those. I was committed to, um, uh, to, to socialism, to uh, nationalism, to collectivism. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine one day, and he was spouting these... Uh, pro-capitalist ideas, kind of market ideas. And I said, you know, where are you getting this, uh, this nonsense from? And uh, he basically handed me a copy of Atlas Shrugged. Uh, and I know many of your members have read Atlas Shrugged. And um, so I read it. It took me a long time to read it. I read it slowly. And uh, I argued with it. I debated with it. I yelled at Ayn Rand. I threw the book on the wall a few times. 
But by the end of the book, uh, I was convinced she had me. Uh, it, it made sense. It was right. Uh, it, it was liberating. It was this new idea, this this new philosophy that I'd never considered, I'd never heard of. Uh, it it basically uh, provided me with with uh, you know moral power, right? It was life was about me. It was about making my life the best that it could be, and. Uh, and, and that was incredible. That was an incredible feeling, an incredible uh, sense. And, you know, at that point, I went on a mission to try to study Ayn Rand's ideas as thoroughly as I can, I could. And in those days, there was no internet. There was no communication. I, I didn't know she was alive. She was still alive then. And uh, I landed up reading as much as I could of Ayn Rand in Israel while I was there. And one of the things that happened when I read her was that I, I decided I wanted to move to the U.S. I, you know, if, if you only live once and the purpose of life is to be happy and to make the most of your life and do the best that you can, then um, you got to go to the place that has the most liberty, the most opportunities, the most uh, uh, opportunities to be successful and, and to, to manifest uh, your, your choices and in, in your, your successes. So um, I served in the Israeli military for three years uh, while committing myself to one day moving to the U.S. Uh, while I was serving, I met a bunch of Israelis who were into Ayn Rand, so we finally found other people and got into debates, discussions. Moved to the U.S. in uh, 1987, uh, 10 years after I read Atlas Shrugged, and uh, with my wife, and went to school. So in Israel, I got my undergraduate degree in civil engineering. So some of you don't know that I was a construction manager once, but uh, I did that for a while. Then I went back to school and got an MBA at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, stayed on to get a PhD in finance. I really liked finance, my finance classes. I enjoyed them. And uh, at that point, uh, I... Uh, oh, this is behaving weirdly. At that point, I uh, uh, landed up getting a PhD and uh, got, became a, a finance professor at Santa Clara University. Worked there for seven years. While I was doing that, I started a business uh, that basically ran conferences about objectivism and Ayn Rand. So I got to know everybody in the Ayn Rand kind of objectivist movement. And uh, when uh, the previous executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute retired, they approached me, asked me if I wanted to be CEO. Uh, so I took that position in 2000, did that until 2017, at which point I uh, moved on to becoming chairman uh, starting my own uh, YouTube channel, podcast. Uh, I give lectures all over the world. I write books. Uh, free market revolution, equal is unfair. Still waiting for the Portuguese translations, but hopefully they will come one of these days. And I also have been involved um, as a partner in a hedge fund since 1998. So I still uh, have my foot in finance and uh, and in investing and making money. So that's, that's always good to, to, to do that as well on the site. So that's kind of my background. I've, I've devoted myself to studying Ayn Rand uh, and uh, to, uh, to teaching her philosophy to the, to, to the best of my ability. Thank you for sharing. We also, I'm also a classic um, liberal. Um, we also prefer the word liberal, but we know that when we do this in English, we have to sort of adjust because of the interpretation. Yep. Yep. That's one comment that I thought was interesting. It's also interesting that the Jewish community in Brazil is, is very liberal, I'd say. We have a lot of um, people of the Jewish community in the Institute, so I think it'd be interesting to study why, but it's interesting that we see them joining us and, 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 and you know, going in that direction with us on those ideas. Because on the, on and, the, in the United States, they tend to be leftists. You know, yeah, they, I, I don't, they vote exactly. Democratic overwhelmingly. They vote, they vote 90% for the left. So it's interesting that in, um, in Brazil, well, liberal, properly understood as neither left nor right, but, uh, exactly. but they all, that they are taking this alternative route is interesting, and it's interesting to understand why. Understand, but, absolutely. The whys are always always make me curious. And I, I remember when you were speaking a joke that we have here in Brazil that we say that when you're young, if you're not a, a collectivist, that you probably don't have a heart or emotions, right? But when you become older and more experienced, if you don't, you know, if you if you, if you don't have, if you're not, you don't become a capitalist or a liberal, you probably lack some type of. So for intellectual, a liberty, mind. intellectual you like a mind, a yeah. mind, exactly. Brains, we brains. have a joke about that, exactly but, in Portuguese. But, so but while that is, standard. Well, that is a is a joke. There are different versions of it all over the world. 
The reality is that if we lived in a proper world, nobody would ever be attracted by socialism in the left. It is a vile, evil ideology, whether you're young, old, or anywhere in between. And collectivism is, is evil. It's a rejection of you as an individual. It's, it's saying that you don't matter. Mm-hmm. And, and no young person should think that they don't matter, right? Uh, it, that, that only the group matters and the purpose of their life is to sacrifice for the group in some way. So, uh, so it, it, it's, um, I, I long for, to live in a world in which everybody gets it and we don't have young, old, you know. The fact is very few people are um, classical liberals in the world in general, young or old. And most of the objectivists, I'd say, they're more young objectivists than old objectivists. And, and a lot of it has to do, so it, it kind of goes against what you just said, it kind of has to do with the fact that objectivism appeals to young people's idealism, to, to them wanting, uh, they're wanting to understand the world and wanting to be moral and wanting to change the world and wanting, wanting to... And then uh, life erodes that uh, idealism and, and they, get, they, get, they, get, they, they succumb to the pressures of society, they succumb to the pressures of uh, uh, you know, the world around them, they get busy. And, and unfortunately, they abandon, um, they abandon their commitment to, uh, to the ideal. But, you know, some of us hold on to it. So uh, that's good. And, and also, before we jump to the next, next question, we were doing an analysis the other day of one of Van Rand's books together at the Institute. And one of our associates did an analysis of sort of the words behind uh, some of it, like individual or individualism. And we saw that they had completely different interpretations dictionary-wise. Brazil versus U.S. Yep. So it's also a cultural thing. And in Brazil, you know, it's, it's sort of almost natural to be a collectivist when you're younger. It's, it's seen as a good thing. It's seen as positive. It's, it's, it's interpreted that way. While in the U.S., and I think this has to the book we read, how we're, you know, the family that we have, the values that we have since the, since the foundations, it's, it's, a, it's a different interpretation in the dictionary. So you see well, how it's, Latin no America is. I mean, Latin America... Is, is, was influenced from the beginning, from really the, found, the, the foundation, by German philosophy, by German romantic philosophy. Uh, Latin America was never influenced by the Anglo-Saxons. It, it, it didn't really have, the Enlightenment didn't really have a profound impact on Latin America because it was primarily Spanish and Portuguese, and the Enlightenment was primarily a phenomena of France and England and to some extent, Central Europe, there were some in Germany, some in, in Northern Europe. But, but it's really, if you really think about it, uh, the modern individualist philosophy started in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where, which was the freest place in Europe in the 17th century, spread to, to France and England and Scotland. That's where the Enlightenment happened. And unfortunately for Latin America, uh, you were much more influenced by the Spanish and Portuguese. And the Spanish and Portuguese, from an intellectual perspective, became followers of the German Romantics and, and much more akin to Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, and Marx uh, than they were to the Locke and Adam Smith and, uh, and, and Hume and, and later on maybe Mill and, and people like that. So it, 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 the Anglo-Saxon world had a healthier intellectual philosophical start than, uh, than the Latin world. Uh, and, and that explains the different dictionary definitions. It explains the different culture, uh, the different levels of respect for the rule of law, for contracts, for private enterprise, for capitalists. You know, in the, in the 19th century, because of the Enlightenment, because of the ideas, the whole approach to making money and to capitalism and production and, and was very different in, in England uh, and in America than it was in the rest of the world. And that positive attitude is what led, uh, and, and drive from philosophy, what led to the success of the Anglo-Saxon world disproportionately uh, globally uh, during that era and then into the 20th century. And, and what Brazil needs, it needs to catch up ideologically. It needs to, you know, uh, it needs to abandon its Marxism and, and Hegelianism and, and Kantianism really the German impact and, and embrace kind of the, the, uh, the, the pro-liberty. You know, the whole term of liberal, you talk about liberal. Liberal is, is really a British word coming out of the, the 19th and 20th century uh, liberal tradition 
of pro-liberty. Liberal meant pro-liberty. And uh, unfortunately, again, that tradition never caught on in, uh, in South America. Maybe, no, but I, there's still I, hope. But there is hope. Completely agree. Yeah. Do you mind if we take a step back? I know we're jumping into the philosophy already. It's actually my favorite part too, and probably whoever's following. But one question I wanted to, to jump back a bit, also for people that are, that are less familiar with your with your name or your work and the institutes. One of the questions that we had here is, you know, you're the president and spokesperson for, for Ayn Rand Institute. You're on the board of the Clemson Institute. Could you tell us just a bit more on how you came into contact with these institutes and, and sort of your role and their role also in, in the U.S. and abroad? Sure. So the, the Ayn Rand Institute was uh, the first place I, I contacted when I moved to America. I mean, it was the source of knowledge about Ayn Rand and about objectivism, which I was studying when I moved to America and I was interested in. So I, I was a student. I'm, um, I uh, uh, attended conferences. Uh, and uh, in the 1990s, when I was a professor, I attended the Ayn Rand Institute's graduate educational program, where we actually dove deep into Ayn Rand's philosophy and really studied it thoroughly. There's a book called Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. We call it OPA for short, uh, written by Leonard Peikoff. And that was the textbook. That's the textbook we used. And that actually is translated into Portuguese. So people can find that. Hopefully it's still in print, but it is in Portuguese, as are many of Ayn Rand's books and and hopefully more to come. Uh, So I I, uh, got to know the Institute uh, because of my interest in Ayn Rand and studied there and, um, and, and took classes from them, got to know all the intellectuals. I also ran a conference business, as I mentioned, and I hired many of the intellectuals, so they were my, my employees as part, part of the, the conference business. Uh, I paid them to speak for me. So that's how I got to know everybody. And, and uh, uh, at some point, they approached me about becoming the CEO of the Institute. With regard to Clemson Institute, um, when there was thought about establishing a se- an institute for the study of capitalism at Clemson, uh, the, the and to be led by an objectivist, and it is led by an objectivist by the name of Bradley Thompson. Um, the faculty they wanted to get to know more about objectivism and get, wanted to know some objectivists to make sure we weren't some crazy, you know, uh, uh, crazy lunatics or something. So I, I visited Clemson several times before the institute was founded to try to figure out what would be the appropriate. Um, uh, what kind of institute to found, who would be a, a good uh, lead for the institute, and uh, to give them comfort that, um, you know, we were not nuts, we, we were not crazies. And uh, I, I was the, one of the people who recommended Bradley Thompson and encouraged them to hire him, and, and that has gone. And I, so I've been uh, uh, on the board of directors of that since its beginning, and it's been phenomenal. It, it's brought the study of capitalism, it's brought the study of really classic uh, education into the heart of Clemson, and it's been a, a, a fantastic experience. Um, interesting, interesting. I, I want to change topics a little bit. I, I was uh, impressed when you said that you, you were born and raised in Israel uh, to a certain point. That's funny, uh, the president of the Rangin Studios was also there. He lived in uh, you know, you know, community. How do you say that again? Uh, kibbutz. Well, a kibbutz. Yeah, exactly. The current, the current but, executive uh, director of the institute, the current CEO of the institute, is somebody I hired, and um, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, he's an Israeli too. So, so the, the the Israelis having a big impact on the objectivist movement. There's no question. Yeah, ab- absolutely, absolutely. But I was thinking about the foundations of the state of Israel, uh, like on Israel's birth, and, and I mean uh, the topic is complex, but. How much is to blame collectivism or individual enterprise to the creation of the state of Israel? And then uh, second to that, uh, like if, if you could just elaborate a little bit more, or what are the foundations for the birth, strengthening, and consolidation of the liberal, libertarian ideals within a country? Uh, because I, I feel like it was pretty collectivist at first, but then uh, there was you know, a, a change with time. Like, How did that happen specifically in Israel? And, it happens overall. Sure. I mean, I think Israel's still very collectivist. So the, 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 the change, there's some change, but nowhere near as deep as we would like it to be. But uh, look, Israel was, Israel, was, um, Israel was founded as a country for Jews to escape anti-Semitism to. 
uh, it was really the vision of a man by the name of Herzl, uh, who lived in the late 19th century, early 20th century, who came to the conclusion that Europe would always be hostile to Jews. Um, he witnessed the Dreyfus trial in the late 19th century in Paris. And the Dreyfus trial was an was a anti-Semitic trial of a, of a, of a, a French, uh, senior French officer who was accused of things that clearly he didn't do. But um, he was found guilty only because of anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism was all over France. And, and Herzl came to the conclusion, he was a completely secular, assimilated Jew. He came to the conclusion, and so was uh, uh, Dreyfus, he came to the conclusion that no matter how assimilated the Jews became, no matter how much they became part of a particular culture, uh, the, the locals would always view them as different and would always, anti-Semitism was always rule. And he thought it would get better, t would get worse to the point where Jews would be uh, murdered in mass. Of course, he predicted in that uh, what the Nazis ultimately did. And he said the only solution to this is for the Jews to, f to start their own country and to emigrate to their country and protect themselves that way from the anti-Semitism, to become a, 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 to band together under the banner of, 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 in a sense, a collectivistic banner, but for self-defense. He was not a collectivist. He was an individualist, but an individualist who realized that to defend himself, he had to get other Jews together to defend it. He didn't care where this Jewish state would be. Um, it, it, you know, the historical home of Jews is Israel, but he didn't care about history and stuff like that. He just cared about protection. And indeed, when the British at some point offered him Uganda, he voted for it. Now, the rest of the uh, Zionist assembly voted against it, but he was for it. He would, he would go anyway just to get a place that, where Jews could be protected. Um, Ultimately, Jews moved to Israel uh, following that dream, the dream of reestablishing establishing a state. Uh, they brought with them to Israel, to what was then Palestine, uh, uh, Western civilization. They brought to it industry, uh, electricity. Uh, they brought to it um, in, uh, uh, opera and, and music and culture and, and individualism to an extent and, um, and, and political freedom. And in 1948, when they established the state, uh, it was established by socialists. So many of the people who moved to Israel were Russian um, socialists who uh, didn't believe, uh, you know, it, it moved before the communist revolution and didn't believe communism or socialism would ever take hold in Russia and wanted to establish that in Israel. And then many of the other Europeans who moved over were uh, socialists. So the country was founded by socialists. Um, secular, uh, atheist in most cases, uh, socialist Jews who wanted this country to, to protect themselves and to create kind of a, a, an oasis uh, in the desert. And they did that. They, they dried the swamps. They created a real uh, industry. But, but there was always this tension between, and there is in any country that has elements of socialism uh, that's Western, there's a tension between uh, allowing people the freedom to be entrepreneurs, to start businesses, to, 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 to do what they want to do as individuals. And the state and what the state demands and the labor unions and everything. And uh, So Israel grew, grew. It succeeded up to a point. Uh, but, for example, in Israel, uh, when I was growing up, the largest employer was the labor unions. Not the government, not business, but the labor unions. The labor unions owned factories and employed people. That system did not work well. Strikes all the time, lack of productivity, uh, and, and real economic uh, stagnation uh, during primarily during the 70s. And then just like in Great Britain and just like in the United States, uh, Great Britain, uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher was elected in the US, uh, Ronald Reagan was elected. There was a backlash against socialism in Israel in 1977. The same year, by the way, that I read Atlas Shrugged. So, just a coincidence, I guess. But uh, there was a real backlash, and, and Begin, who was the first non-socialist to be elected prime minister in Israel's history, was elected. And while he was a mixed bag, very nationalist, very, very collectivistic, he also wanted to liberate the Israeli economy. And, and during the following 15 years or so, the Israeli economy was liberated, I'd say, 
all the way to around um, into the 2000s, there was slow, steady improvements in, uh, in liberalizing the Israeli economy and increasing economic freedom. But the collectivism still stayed to a large extent, at least as our government policy. The nationalism, the collectivism, the tribalism still exists in Israel. Uh, but there is an element of individualism um, and there is an element of economic freedom. And that's why you see Israel as the startup nation, entrepreneurship. And it's a whole question of why Israel is so successful in terms of startups. Partially it's economic liberalization, but also partially it's, uh, you know, Jews are very, uh, the Jewish culture is very focused on learning, very focused on intellectual side. So uh, a lot of Israelis study a lot. They, they, they care about the mind. So they, they devote a lot of resources to that. But there's also a tradition among Jews, uh, particularly Israelis, um, of argumentation, of, of disagreement, of not standing still, yelling at the dinner, dinner table, arguing with everybody and debating like crazy. And that is a good mindset for entrepreneurship. That is the last thing you want are people that say, yes, okay, everything's fine. Um, entrepreneurs are disagreeable. They are people who want to change the status quo. They're people who are impatient. They're people who want to imprint their views on the world. Sometimes they fail, but failure is no big deal. They failed many times around the dining room table in their argumentation. So nobody cares about failure. You start up again and you go at it again, or you start a different business. So Israel is very, very attuned to entrepreneurship and entrepreneur mentality and in tech, which requires education and the mind and, 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 and logic and so on, um, is very fitting to the kind of educational tradition among Israeli uh, Israelis. So... Um, I think that has led to the success, but there is still this tension, always will be, in Israel between the collectivism under which it was founded. Uh, and, and there's a lot of religious, religio religious people in Israel who, who um, for example, want to exclude Arabs from, from civil society, uh, Muslims from civil society, and that's anti-individualistic and, and, and wrong. And uh, there's a tension between the nationalism and collectivism and the free market and, and individualism. And that tension continues and will continue for a long time. If I could just oh, very, on that. Yeah. Just to, but, but, to, to, I think just guide us back here, Tomas. Um, I think one thing that's interesting of what you said, Yara, and, is, and it's a strong belief on, on, I think on our side and a lot of what we discuss around conservatism too, is family, right? And I mean, a lot of the, the family values that are very strong in Britain and the US date back to the Magna Carta, Right, that are is very connected with, with Jewish and Christian values. And even that idea of the, the, the healthy and productive disagreement and rational debates dating back to you know, Aristotle's think, thinking and so on. So that's probably a very key, important value there too. Um, do you mind if, I think just in, before we jump into the second topic, which I think where, is where Tomas was going to drive us, and I, it might take you, we're going to take you back to history again, sure. but you probably saw that one of the topics that we, we brought in for this debate today or this discussion today was Tocqueville, right? And yep. what he saw in the U.S. back then and what we see in the U.S. now. So do you mind doing a similar parallel of, you know, the, the founding fathers, USA or America versus, you know, what's happened over time and where the U.S. is, is now. I think it compares also to what you were just saying. Oh, absolutely. It, it's going to be very depressing, though, I warn you. Um, look, America was, is a unique country. It, it, it's, it's a unique country. It's the only country in the world that was established on a moral principle, on an ethical principle. Uh, it is the main achievement, the highlight of the Enlightenment politically. Uh, so what is the principle the, the, the United States is founded on? It's founded on the principle of individual rights. And individual rights is not some random idea people came up with. It's not uh, something that's implanted into us by God. It's not we just have it because nature gave it to us. It's, it's, it's you know, it's somewhere inside of us. I, you know, as, as, as many will tell you, if you open up a human being, there are no rights inside because that's not what it works. 
Rights are moral concept. Rights are concept that identify the fact that for human beings to thrive, for human beings to be successful, they must be free to act on their reason. They must be free to act on the conclusions of their own mind. And what does freedom mean in this context? Freedom means free of coercion, free of force, free of authority, free of dictates. They should be able to think and act based on their own judgment. And individual rights is a way to conceptualize that, to articulate this idea of freedom and the idea that this freedom must be protected by the institution that we create in a society as a monopoly over the use of force. That is the only role of government, according to the founding of America, is the protection of individual rights. That's what government instituted among men to do, protect inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it's, it's that concept of rights that makes America completely different, right? You don't really have that in Brazil. You, you don't complain about the violating my rights because, you know, the, that tradition coming out of the Enlightenment doesn't exist, and it doesn't exist in Latin America, and to a large extent, it doesn't exist in Europe. It is a, an American phenomenon because America was the country founded out of the ideas of the Enlightenment. It, 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 the, it, it's a falsehood that America is a Christian country. America is not a Christian country. America is the country that uh, 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 relegates religion to your home. In the public square, it is about reason and ideas and philosophy. It is the country of John Locke and Voltaire and, uh, and Montesquieu and the English and Scottish Enlightenment. That is what America is. Now, what does that mean? It means that the government traditionally in America was very limited in its scope. While it never completely lived up to the promise of the Declaration of Independence, uh, limiting itself only to protecting rights, it did a pretty good job of, of being limited, small, not intervening in people's affairs too much. Um, and, it, and as a consequence of that, it was a country that was the freest country in the world and a country that was um, opened its borders and where millions and millions and millions of people flowed in so that uh, it, is a, it was a country of immense economic growth, immense freedom and immense, uh, you know, success. A country in which people came in pursuit of their happiness. People came in pursuit of wealth. People came in pursuit of success. People left their families knowing they would never see them again, cross the Atlantic Ocean, or the, in some cases, the Pacific Ocean, and you know, built a new life in America. So it was a, that's the America uh, Tocqueville uh, in, encountered. A, a land of immigrants, a land of uh, ambitious people, he talks about their self-interest, uh, a land in which personal initiative, community initiative, but initiative at the community level rather than top down was what allowed the country to grow and be successful. A country of industry, hard work, attitudes of people, pride in the work and in their success and their ability to grow. Um, it, 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 was a, it was a country of you know, people were religious, but they kept the religion to themselves and did not interfere in other people's religion. I mean, uh, if you think about Christianity, Protestant religion splintered into a thousand different sects and they were all over the United States. There was no official religion. So religion uh, partially prospered because there was no state religion. There was no uh, intervention of religion. So uh, the, 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 the country back then was a country where the federal government never spent more than 3 4% of GDP, uh, except in the Civil War. Uh, it was a country in which um, states were left alone. It was a country in which individuals were free to live their lives as they so fit. 
to where their rights for the most part were protected, not completely, but for the most part. Now, it was also a flawed country, right? I mean, there's no question that at the same time, uh, there was also slavery, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the Tocqueville, Tocqueville talks about that. Uh, the South, I think, as Tocqueville describes it, was suffering from that slavery, that, that slavery was holding the South back. The, the North was much richer, much more successful, much more prosperous than the South. Um, but nevertheless, it was a divided country as a consequence. That division went away after the Civil War. But unfortunately, so did... Uh, there was a slow erosion of that idea of limited government. So if you uh, come to today, America today, America today has a government, a federal government that is about four to five times larger than it was back then on a per capita GDP, on a G, not per capita, on a GDP basis, a percent of GDP. And if you take into account state government and local government, it is probably, uh, you know, seven to eight times bigger than it was back then. We have a lot less freedom. Uh, our lives are regulated and controlled by a bureaucracy that cares nothing for our liberties and freedom. There's no conception of individual rights. Nobody, nobody understands individual rights. You could take the last... I don't know, certainly the last five presidents, and they would fail a quiz on what are individual rights or what are the founding fathers' conception of the individual rights or what does the Constitution actually say, what does the Constitution mean, what does the Declaration of Independence mean? They're complete morons when it comes to the American founding and, and the ideas of America. Indeed, that is true of the bureaucracy. That is true of our presidents, and sadly, it is even true of our Supreme Court. There's almost no Supreme Court justice today who understands, even superficially, the concept of individual rights. Maybe two, maybe three at most. And even there, it's not a deep understanding of individual rights. It's a superficial understanding of individual rights. So, uh, so long the founding of America is long forgotten. We are now very much like a European country. Uh, we have a welfare state. We have a regulatory state. We have massive government. We have a massive military with bases in 100 plus countries around the world. Um, you know, we, 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 uh, we don't really stand for anything anymore. Uh, freedom Liberty are words that people say and have no understanding and no relevance to their life. Uh, it, it, we are a uh, country now that leads the world in bizarre, stupid, ridiculous ideologies from critical race theory to the alternative right um, and, and uh, everything in between, intersectionality. And I mean, we export this stuff. This stuff has been exported to Europe. It used to be that all bad philosophy came from Germany. Now we're sending our bad philosophy back to Germany. So uh, uh, we're exporting it around the world. And it's, it's sad because there's still a remnant of... Um, there's still a remnant of the sense of life, of, of liberty, of, uh, of Americanism, of freedom... But it doesn't manifest itself politically. There's no political manifestation of it. And it is really just at the level of sense, of a feeling. There are very few intellectuals who stand for it. There are very few. And as a consequence, you know, we got excited. Americans got excited when the economy under Donald Trump grew at 2% a year. I, I hate to break it to people, but 2% a year is pathetic. Our economy should be growing at 4, 5, 6% a year. And there's no reason it cannot. There is no limits to growth. There's no such thing. The only limitations to growth are limitations imposed by government policy. So we grow slowly. We stagnate. Our government grows nonstop. We have massive debt. We, debt to GDP now is over 100% or, or just over 100%. It's going to grow even bigger. Uh, there's no prospects for serious economic growth in the United States. Entrepreneurship is in decline. 
um, and and uh, innovation is in decline. It's 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 a depressing picture. Uh, Tocqueville would not recognize America. He would he, it would look like Europe rather than um, rather than the United States taking over the world. At least Europe has infected America, and and I blame it on German philosophy. So and Ayn Rand blamed it on German philosophy. It really is the 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 Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx axis. And, and, and more, more recently, I would even add uh, Nietzsche access, the nihilism uh, implied ultimately in Nietzsche that is destroying the U.S. and ultimately destroying the West. Thank you, Yeah, oh. I, mean, I, I think we have a similar perspective. I don't know if, if Tomas also wants to jump in here, but one of the things that I wanted to comment was that um, it sort of reminds me in living abroad from the U.S. of that, that perspective of a, a third generation of a family-owned company where the founders, they know what they're doing. They know why they made that decision. Usually the, the, the children understand because they were there, they listened to the, the, the family, but the third generation has it only at like a sentiment level. It's no longer taught or discussed. It's not reflected on. There's no true philosophy there. It's just, it's just a sentiment of what used to be. And the feeling that I have when I see people discussing this in the US is they're, they're, they're saying that they want certain things without even understanding why they're important and what's needed to get there, and what are the foundations for that to exist. Um, I have a similar perspective. And Thomas, do you want to add anything? I was going to jump to the next question, which I think connects with this. No, uh, I just wanted to comment quickly. First thing is that our Supreme Court has bigger problems. I know how much you you know into that, but we're, we're having an institutional crisis right now in Brazil. Uh, and one of our, our IFL's partners here is called Brasil Paralelo, and they make a, a wonderful job uh, talking, you know, more about the basics of society, you know. Uh, so, so they talk about philosophy again, cultural values, family values, and and that, you know, in a lot of senses precedes uh, the, the path for liberty. Uh, and that's kind of like how I felt you, you exposed the matter. And I think they're pretty much right in that sense that you can't just, you know, uh, throw, throw down their, their throat, uh, liberal ideas, as, as we've seen, you know, in all the, the Middle East, uh, Middle East interventions, uh, you know, and the, the recumbent uh, failure in, in Afghanistan more recently. But, but you know, overall, I think that's, that's a good thing, you know, to actually work with the basics and, and, and get, a, you know, uh, and get, get people to actually imprint a, a liberal uh, view uh, based on philosophy first then then politics itself so i think that's that's probably the uh, the way i don't know if you want to comment on that yeah, I mean, or i'll, I'll just say that it's mm -hmm. it's very difficult to export your ideology it is very difficult mm -hmm. to um to change other countries when you don't have that ideology anymore you don't believe in anything what what is what does a george w bush believe in that he's going to change the middle east and what to what to the mixed economy neither here nor there, stand for nothing, modern America. Um, what exactly is, uh, are we going to change Afghanistan to? A little bit more Western? Uh, so to change another country or another culture, one has to actually believe in something and actually hold an ideology and be consistent in holding that ideology. And then be willing to educate that other culture and be willing to say, for example, which we're not today, your culture is primitive and bad. Our culture is good. You should adopt our culture. Here it is. But we can't even say that. I mean, George W. Bush, a month after 9-11, was celebrating the Ramadan in the White House. Uh, you're not going to change the Muslim world by celebrating their holidays a month after they attacked you and, 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 and decimated you, right? Um, I, I, so you have to have some pride and confidence and, a, and, and knowledge of your own virtues, of, your, of what you have to offer the world, if you have any hope in changing that world. Completely agree. Um... I think what, what also what Tomas was referring to, and it's, it's an interesting movement here in Brazil. I mean, in the US you have, you know, Fox, which is, I wouldn't say it's liberal thinking, right? It's not, it, it, I don't think it also goes into philosophy in any single manner, no. to be honest. Um, but in, the, in Brazil, interestingly enough, we've had a, a, an alternative media 
um, coming up and, and actually getting a lot of attention in space um, in people's at people's houses and in minds, discussing philosophy, discussing good music, discussing good family values, good, discussing good books, discussing where you spend your time at home with your family, with your mind, with yourself. Um, I find it, I'm blown away when I see this happening and we're, they're actually good friends of ours. We, we work together. We think we have a similar direction we want to achieve, but that's happening in Brazil. That's it, it's being born 20 or 30 or 40 million people are seeing that discussing that at their home. I mean, people I know are, are signing up and watching that content. I mean, it, it, it's discussing philosophy at, at its basis. So it, it makes me optimistic about the, the future of Brazil <laughs> and somehow because that, that, that the discussion is happening. Um, and, and one thing yeah, I had to jump to. And I, think, I, I think that's sorry. right. I, I'll, I'll mention this. I, I do think that there is, I mean, I was very impressed by um, the intellectuality of, of Brazilian culture and uh, the, the inclination within Brazil to, to look at philosophy and, and to study it. Um, and there is a certain desperation in Brazil that doesn't exist in America yet. That is, you guys have tried everything. And it's all failed, everything except freedom, right? And it's all failed. And people are miserable. And it's, it's, and it's you know, the 200 million Brazilians and the, the GDP per capita is still very low. Uh, there's unbelievable corruption uh, and a very well-educated, very, um, uh, you know, intellectual population can't get anything done. Everything is bogged down and people are pissed off and upset and, and, and have had it. So, and, and, and it's partially why you elected somebody like Bolsonaro. But it's that level of frustration opens people up to maybe new ideas. So, so I, I was in, uh, I think it was in Sao Paulo at the airport and I was looking through uh, uh, the bookstore. And first, you can often find Ayn Rand's books at the airports, in, in, in Brazilian airports, in the bookstores. But, the other, but what I found was uh, this book, and it, it, it was, a, it was a, a book with a bunch of pictures of philosophers on it. And it was something like Philosophy for Dummies or something like that, but it, written by a Brazilian. And I'm looking at this, and there's Ayn Rand's picture. And it was like, whoa, uh, you know, that would never happen in the U.S. Nobody would write a book on Philosophy for Dummy kind of thing and have Ayn Rand in the picture. So... In America, Ayn Rand is taboo, right? You're not supposed to read her. You're not supposed to like her. Uh, all of her critics, most of her critics have never even read her. But in Brazil, Ayn Rand is this interesting woman, philosopher from the United States. Why not include her in this and, and discuss her and debate her? So in that sense, I think there's a lot more openness in Brazil today to uh, these ideas. I think organizations like IFL... Um, and uh, what was the organization started in um, in Porto Alegre? Uh, I, 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 I uh, kind of brought Ayn Rand into the mainstream, at least with young businessmen, and uh, and I think that you know all the IFL and IE chapters all over Brazil, they read Ayn Rand, they're engaged in Ayn Rand, and you guys are the future of Brazil. You are the the business leaders, the intellectual leaders. You will have an impact on future generations. And so I am, you know, I haven't been in Brazil because of COVID for a while, but every time I come to Brazil, I get really, really energized and excited because there is a, there is a potential there that I don't see anywhere else in the world to a large extent because of IFL and IE. And they have elevated, the, you guys have elevated the discussion. There are more intellectuals in Brazil willing to debate and discuss Ayn Rand's ideas and to discuss philosophical ideas more broadly. There's still a lot of problems. There's still way too much mysticism uh, uh, in Brazil. There's way too much religion in Brazil. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it, 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 you know, and, and the, you know, you have a character like Bolsonaro who got elected, which is problematic. But there is this real potential. There's this real potential of people studying ideas, taking ideas seriously. Uh, you know, what was it? The T-shirts, uh, uh, there were these T-shirts in, um, uh, during the student up, uh, kind of uh, demonstrations uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, less Marx, more Mises. Like, what place in the world would even know who Mises is? Never mind less Marx, more Mises. Only in Brazil 
Could that happen? You you wore T-shirts in the in the United States like that. People would go, "Who the hell is Mises?" We don't know who Mises is, but in Brazil it became a thing, and 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 Mises became somebody people understood, people recognized, and um, and 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 that that is that is amazing. Yeah, I'm also, we're also I mean proud of it. I mean, it's still a potential, right? It hasn't yes. really. Definitely just a potential. Come but, into something yet. But we, we you hear uh, among different groups, you know, Hayek, Rothbard, Mises, Bashia, and others dating back to, you know, ancient Greece. And it's it's uh, it's it has potential. And it gets me optimistic about where we can arrive to, because, as you mentioned, these are the people, the people that joined Bolsonaro's government. They were supporting him somehow because this was an attempt to go in, in something that we saw some value in. A lot of them came from our groups, people that were reading this and studying this. And yep. they're liberals yep. among, you know, before anything <laughs> and rational thinkers before anything. So they've been really making the difference. And, and Yana, I mean, recently we saw also The Economist, right? Uh, that, that, I thought that was an interesting um, cover talking about the illiberal left, right? And they, I, I, it it's was been like a while this since week I've or seen, something. This week or last this week. week. Yeah. This week, exactly. And I was actually really interested to read it and see it because it's not something you see come up in the U.S. a lot. That type of topic usually gets canceled. There's a lot of aggression towards it. It's not accepted. Um, and, I don't, and what I don't they think, say, basically, I don't think that's true. I, I, I think there's a lot of people writing about the liberal left in America. It's just to have a, a mainstream publication, mainstream, mainstream, which, which the Economist exactly, yeah. is, you could argue, center left center right depends on who the editor is in any given week but it's it's real mainstream for them to recognize it but yeah i, I think one of the great tragedies in the world right now is the rise of illiberalism right the rejection of of of, of the better parts of the liberal tradition and it, you know and that includes uh freedom it includes uh, individualism it includes uh uh, you know, democracy, limited democracy, democ democracy limited to the protection of individual rights. And, and you've seen that on the left and on the right. Um, and and uh, but you're seeing that with Orban in Hungary. Right. And and the American rights fascination with Orban in Hungary. Oh, if only we could have this kind of power over people and, and the media, because Orban is basically equivalent to nationalizing the media in Hungary. Um, it's, uh, it, it, and, and of course, the left is, uh, there was just an article, and, and this is a, a good example of, the, in Atlantic magazine, Atlantic is also very critical of the illiberal left. And Atlantic is, again, left of center. And they just have a, a story about the new Puritans. And who are the new Puritans? They're the leftists. The leftists who, you're not allowed to say this word or that word. You're not allowed to uh, a, a touch a woman in this way. Or, you know, just everybody gone nuts around, uh, around on the left. And who, you know, they don't burn people at the stake, but they, uh, or they, don't, but they basically uh, accuse you of witchcraft and, and, and uh, label you, uh, you know, a bad person. You can't get a job. You can't get published in academia. So uh, there is a widespread recognition now that the wacky left has gone wacky, that, that they're very liberal, that they're anti-freedom, that they, that they are not liberal anymore. In America, the liberal used to mean left. But the left has moved so far to the left that even the liberals, the leftists in America, don't consider them part of them. So um, it's, um, it, is, uh, it is now recognized that, and I think this is the trend that we're, we're going to be experiencing in the next few years in Europe and in the United States, that, um, that we are moving more and more in an illiberal direction. It, it reminds me a little bit, right now, I've just been reading about the Weimar, Rep Weimar Republic and about the period between World War I and World War II. And while I'm not saying we're heading towards World War II or Hitler or anything like that, it does feel very similar to that period. Uh, a loss of any kind of sense of confidence, um, a complete rejection of individualism. It's just basically all the collectivists out fighting among each other completely, uh, uh, complete uh, extremes. The, the thing that even makes now worse than the Weimar Republic is that even the United States has bought into it. That is, even America, in, in the 1920s and 30s, there was, there was FDR, but generally America stood apart from this. It still was America. Now, 
America is part of this great divide of illiberal left and illiberal right and the, the battle between them. And look, no matter who wins that battle, what you get is illiberalism. What you get is authoritarianism. What you get is a, is a, is a, uh, a negation of everything we believe in. So, I, I, you know, the more I read about Weimar Republic, of course, Leonard Peikoff wrote a great book called The Ominous Parallels, which unfortunately is not in Portuguese, but it is in English, uh, where he, he parallels the evolution in German society to American uh, society um, uh, through the 1970s. And I think everything he said is right. It, it was just, um, it's coming to fruition much more today than it did back then. And it's, it's very, very scary to see what's going on, how, how people are fascinated by authoritarians. I mean, think about uh, Trump's fascination with Xi in China, how much he admired him. Like, uh, people respected Xi, and people didn't respect Trump, and he was offended by it. He wanted, he wanted the kind of respect Xi gets, which is an authoritarian. Or how much he, he respected Ogawan in, in Turkey, or, um, or any one of these, author or Orban in Hungary, or any one of these authoritarians was somebody that, that he looked up to. And today, if you, if you watch Tucker Carlson, same thing. They love the strongman. They love the strongman. And... Um, that's scary on the right, and we know that the left is already there. The left just wants to jump in on that. And there are people in the middle trying to stave off both sides. But it's very difficult because the middle, unless you're truly liberal, the middle is boring. The middle is uninteresting. The middle is unidealistic. And therefore, the masses are not attracted to the middle. The mass is attracted to the left and attracted to right. And you, we talked about this. You, you, you're experiencing the same thing in Brazil. You've got an election now of two nutcases, two populists, complete nuts, complete imbeciles, right? These are not people who have any qualifications to be president of a local union, never mind a country as big as Brazil, Lulu and Bolsonaro, and yet they generate the passion, the passion for the left on Lulu, the passion on the right for Bolsonaro. And if you came and tried to be rational and, and try to capture the center, people would ignore you. They're not interested. So the sad state of the world is that this, uh, this kind of left, this kind of uh, appeal to the passions is what is winning the day. It's what winning the day and, and reason, thoughtfulness, is not in vogue. Nobody is interested. Nobody cares. Yeah, and and if uh, you think about the founding of America, the founders were real intellectuals. They were super smart, super intellectuals. They were opposite of populists. Uh, they they took the country with them where they wanted it to go. They were well read. They they wrote. They were men of letters. They could write well. They had libraries, they studied. These were, some of them were scientists, uh, Franklin, for example. These were amazing um, intellectuals, and yet they got the whole country to move them forward. Today, you get, you get the, the dumbest, most um, ignorant uh, uh, people running for politics, and, uh, and partially because the population, the people, have been dumbed down to the level of all they care about is who can rail the emotions more. And it's also interesting, yeah, and I mean, to reflect on that, that point is the, the article in The Economist, and I think you're, you're right, I was referring more to it to being mainstream and mainstream that gets to Brazil, right, and seeing yeah, that coming yeah, out from yeah. a U.S. mainstream. Well, vehicle. Economist is, they Britain, also, is not, not the U.S. Yeah. Not the U.S., it's for sure. British, British and, and yeah. One of the references that we get here, right, when we, we see what's being written there and discussed and um, they also, as you mentioned, they, they, they reflect on the attack on debate and, and rational thinking. Um, and not only just the liberal left, but the attack on rational thinking and philosophy, right? And it, it sort of reminds me of what Abraham Lincoln said of the mediocre man, or what Mises said of anti-capitalism, and how you know, people in many cases, I mean, the majority of us are mediocre, right? That's, that's how it works. And, it, that there's no equality before, and, and, and you should never, I think, accept that. You should fight for your individuality and your growth and stuff. But 
I think there's an element of that also in these populist leaders. Um, yeah, but but think about it. I mean, being mediocre doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I mean, I'm a mediocre basketball player. That doesn't cause me to resent, uh, you know, great basketball players, right? So uh, uh, the, the, the fact that maybe you're mediocre doesn't say anything about your attitude to greatness and success. It is not deterministic in that sense. So uh, America was always full of people who, you know, most of them were average. That's how average works, right? Uh, you can't have a place where everybody's above average. So uh, uh, some are below average, some are average, some are above average. But people didn't resent the people who were above average. People didn't resent the wealth creators, the scientific geniuses, the, 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 the people who changed the world. They thanked them. They appreciated them because they understood that they benefited from them. You know, I have a huge amount of respect for people who are far smarter than me because of what they give me, whether it's Ayn Rand, who's far smarter than me, thank you for the philosophy, whether it's uh, Jeff Bezos, who's a far better businessman than I am, thank you for Amazon, it changed my life, or Steve Jobs or whatever. So your level of, I don't know, intelligence or ability in any, is not determinant of your philosophy. So the, peop the reason people today resent those above, and this is where I think Mises is wrong, is not dictated by the economic standard. In that sense, he's too Marxist. It's determined by their ideas, by their philosophy, and by their appreciation of what other people grant them. A, a world in which everybody is an egoist, where everybody cares only about himself, is a world where people respect the achievements of others because they know that they benefit when others achieve. They know that the principle guiding human behavior as an egoist is trade, value for value, win-win. Um, it's only a world in which we're taught that you deserve, that you should be equal in outcome, that the world is a zero-sum game, as Marxism teaches us, or at least modern Marxists teach us, that everything's about exploitation, that other people's success is at your expense. That is the world in which, in which um, uh, the kind of culture that we have today can exist where people resent one another. Socialism leads to resentment everywhere, always. Capitalism is benevolent. Capitalism leads to uh, mutual respect. Great reflection. Um, tend to agree on many of the points too. To, we have a couple. We had a couple more questions here, but before we jump over to the questions from the, the general public here that are following us in the event, one I think broader question that I think we discussed together is um, and thinking about the, the condition of the, where the world is now and, and where we're going across different regions. If you had to name one sort of genuine um, liberal leader in the world today, <laughs> who would that be, and what is what is his characteristics, and why is he is he closer to that? that mentality or that position or those values? I don't think there is one. I can't think of one. I mean, just go down you, the Americas, right? Start with Canada. We've got a socialist leftist in Canada. We've got a leftist in the United States. And we had, uh, Trump was no liberal in, 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 the, in the positive sense, right? Mexico is a socialist. Um, Latin America, is there any liberal in Latin, in, in Latin America today? I can't think of one. One would have, one would have hoped that um, the guy in Chile, I forget his name, um, the president of Chile, Piñera. Piñera would be because it, it, they were part of the, of the Chicago boy revolution, but he's stabbed liberalism in the back. He's, he's turned his back on liberalism completely. Um, nobody, Paraguay, Uruguay, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, Colombia, there was some hope, but he turned out to be false hope. Uh, and now much of the rest of North, kind of that North part of South America is, is turning Marxist. Uh, so you saw that in Ecuador, you see it in Peru. Peru just elected a Marxist um, to the government. So I don't see anybody in, uh, in Europe, nobody. I mean, uh, you, you move from Portugal uh, East, right? Portugal, no, Spain, no, France, no. Uh, Germany, no, Angela Merkel is far from a liberal. Uh, in, a, in a positive sense, Scandinavia, eh. I mean, Scandinavia might, in some bizarre, funny sense, be the closest. England, certainly not. I mean, uh, the, the conservatives in England right now are completely selling out on everything, whether it was on COVID lockdowns 
or whether it's on climate change now and 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 completely uh, or, or whether it was the renationalization basically of the railroad system or parts of the railroad system recently um uh, certainly not eastern what? europe there's no liberals in eastern europe so i don't know if you have a suggestion i'm i'm open to hearing it <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I would suggest just open up the, to a broader uh, view like getting out of uh, the politics or poli political maybe arena estonia. and thinking about like maybe estonia maybe yeah. i don't know Estonia for sure, <laughs> but what 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 about somebody that you know? It could be even a, a sportsman, a businessman, you know, uh, that is re really making a change in the world and represents you know uh, the, the real uh, classical liberal values. Would you say? I, mean, I don't know. Like you could uh, argue Jeff Bezos, whatever. I don't know. Um, anybody who's prominent and is willing to go out there and and really take the stage as, as, a, as a real classical liberal. I mean, John Allison, when he was CEO of bb and I don't know if you know John Allison, he was CEO of the 10th largest financial institution in the U.S., certainly was a, uh, a champion of objectivism and a champion of, of capitalism and was CEO of a big corporation. But uh, it really is pretty bleak out there in terms of the voices. I, I think that the change is bubbling up under the surface it's at places like IFI. It's at places like we just did an objectives conference with 400 people. Um, it's, it's, you know, and it's some of them business leaders, but just up and coming, you know, young people like you guys who are, who are going to make, the, make uh, you know, their, their place in the world, create their place in the world. Um, it, it's just the world right now is not receptive to these ideas and not open to these ideas. And, and if you do, you know, there's somebody like Daniel Hannon, in the United States, who is a little better, but even he, I think, sells out once in a while. Uh, it's hard to to find somebody who's consistent. Uh, it's hard to be in politics if you're going to be consistent. It's hard to be successful as an intellectual if you're consistent. Uh, you know, I, I people who sell out are far more popular on YouTube than people who are consistent uh, on, on, on in in on uh, you know on these ideas. Certainly. There's no objectivist who is a super celebrity on YouTube, partially because our ideas are still so foreign, so controversial, so radical, for even for uh, people who call themselves libertarians, because libertarianism doesn't require you to have any philosophy. And we kind of agree vaguely on ideas about liberty. Objectivism is a philosophy. Uh, with a metaphysics and epistemology and ethics, uh, a view of art, right? And politics, yeah, politics, but politics is not the center. Politics is the end. So um, it's, it's very difficult in a culture that doesn't respect philosophy, not interested in philosophy, to really make significant inroads with a philosophy that's super radical, super different than anything else that people recognize. Thank you, Garen. I was thinking of also when, I, when you mentioned that, I was thinking Estonia and Taiwan has been also, I think, one of the tending towards that, even with all the, the challenges in, in the Asian region. Yeah, I mean, region, but Taiwan is a great country, and it's one of the great tragedies in the geopolitics of the world today is that none of our countries recognize it as a country. It, you know, the United States has no embassy in Taiwan, has no diplomatic relations in Taiwan because they cut a deal with the devil. They cut a deal with China. Um, and, uh, and they refuse to renege on that deal. But it's, it's truly sad that, um, you know, uh, truly sad. It does. And it, it also, I think it leads back also to the, 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 the triangle, right, of, you know, the U.S. and Japan and, and the defense of Japan post-World War II versus the relationship with, between Japan and China and how much of China has in the U.S. debt. And we're, you know, the U.S. is stuck in that somehow. So it, it is some type of pact. Level, I agree. Yep. It's a tricky situation to be in. Um, ju jumping to the, some of the questions here, I'm going to start with the with the tricky one, which I don't even know if the, this was said or not, but it was a question that came in. Um, one of the people here, they, they asked, um, they mentioned that when you were in Brazil and you visited some of the favelas, right, the, the slums, um, that you suggested that the state could supply or, you know, land um, to some of the poor people. Again, correct me if this is wrong or this is a misinterpretation. Um, and it does it help poverty? No. Um, is, is, I mean, the solution for the favelas <laughs> is easy. And at, at least in Rio, maybe maybe in other parts of Brazil, it's a little harder. But in Rio, it's, it's, it's easy. 
Look, the state doesn't supply land to anybody. The state should have no land. Not the Amazon, not any land, not any rivers, not any beaches. The state is not an entity that should own anything, not even Brasilia. So the, the, the land, the land already, uh, uh, from a philosophical perspective, the land already belongs to the people in the favelas. They own it because they're using it, because they used it to promote their lives, to make their lives better. They used it for businesses. They used it. Use of land as going back to Locke, mixing your mind, your labor, and the land makes it yours. That's the essence. That's the origins in that sense of, 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 of property. So my solution to poverty in Rio, now, so I went into the favelas in Rio. And when you go into the favelas in Rio, you realize immediately that they sit on the best property in Rio. Like, I don't get this. It doesn't make any sense to me that middle class rich people live low and the poor people live high. I mean, high is where the views are. I mean, I would pay a fortune to have a villa at the top of one of those favelas with the best view in the world, right? I think Rio de Janeiro is the most beautiful city in the world. I've been to a lot of cities. And if, if you could live up there and see the, the, the geography, the beaches, the, 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 the mountains, the, oh, it's, it's magnificent. So I say give them property rights, give them a deed on the land, which they already own morally, and let them sell it to, to foreigners who want to build villas at the top of the favelas. Let them sell it to hotels. Imagine a hotel at the top there with that kind of view. They would sell out like this. So the, 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 and this is, by the way, not just a, a, my view. Uh, Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist, who is a, who is a, a, a liberal economist, has suggested this a long time ago. He says just one of the ways to cure poverty or to, to reduce poverty in Latin America is to give poor people ownership of the land that they are cultivating, on the land that they are living on. Then they can get a mortgage, right? They can use the capital to buy a tractor or to start a small business or to buy some inventory. And that's how you get economic activity going, not by giving them money, top down, but by giving them property, by giving them ownership of something they already own for all intents and purposes. So I believe that all of the favelas in Brazil should be privatized. The state should own none of it. Now, people say that rewards um, uh, going and settling on government land without permission. Good. Everybody should settle on government land without permission so that we privatize it all. There should be no government land. You know, imagine selling off the Amazon to private enterprise, some of it to preserve it forever, like you could sell it to these nonprofits that want to preserve the Amazon. Great. Others would do other stuff with it. But imagine selling off all the natural resources that Brazil has to private investors, including, by the way, foreign investors. Brazil would immediately become a rich country and, and, and a free country and an innovative country. But nobody would ever do that because, like, it goes against the nationalist uh, tendency. So, uh, yes, I am for curing poverty in Brazil by selling off, the by giving the favelas to uh, the people who already live there. Interesting reflection. It's, it's one that I haven't given enough thought, I think, and uh, get to hear your perspective on that, too. I'm curious what, um, the, what, the, what the negative would be, what, what the counter argument would be. What, what, I mean, they live there already. Nobody's going to take them away. For, nobody's going to kick them off. That's not happening, right? They already live there. Why not give them a deed? Recognize the fact I mean, and the reality. Philosophically thinking, one thing that people might raise, and again, I haven't, it's not a perspective of mine, but just walking through the options could be sort of the rule of law of the process, right? And, and rule of law in Brazil? In Brazil cares about the rule of law? Give me a break, <laughs> and, right? So, and that's so, why I think it's optimistic, right? It's of, sort of utopic but, the, but the point is this, of all the laws that people break in Brazil all the time, including the judges and the police and the, and the politicians, the law of settling on government land to break that, you know, is a pretty small law in comparison. So let's turn 
to turn a blind eye to that law, which, by the way, again, in my view, is an Imala law because there should be no government land. Yeah, I think the I won't want to go too, too long on this because we have other questions too, but I think one of the, the challenges with that is, is sort of what I described to you when I arrived in Brazil of, you know, we, we used to have a, 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 a mayor in, in Sao Paulo who said, would say publicly that he would steal, but he would get stuff done, right? And I think the, the point of the rule of law, and I, and I, I think you're, it's a good discussion, it's, it's, it's just doing that legally and openly, right? Just what does that promote? And that's, that's just a philosophical discussion, right? If you start breaking the rule of law somehow knowingly, but when, the, but, and, but when the law is unjust, then it can what, be. what the state needs to do is reverse it. So, for example, slavery was the law in Brazil and in the United States. And then at some point we said, oh, man, this is an immoral, bad law. We got rid of it. So uh, if the law says these people, you know, it's like immigration in the United States. The law is unjust today. And a lot of people who came here should be legalized, right? The solution is not to penalize them. The solution is to change the law. Good discussion. We, me and Thomas have had a debate of the law many times before. So, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, I was about to jump into that. Yeah, I'm it's on been your a side, long yeah. discussion between <laughs> us. But anyway, j- jumping to another question here. Um, this one comes from Felipe. Um, he, his just, I think it was an interesting question. He asks, "How do you prevent liberalism from becoming a monopolist game?" Right. And, and he adds here, the best getting so big that no one could compete. What's your perspective on that, Aaron? It doesn't happen. Never has, never will. Uh, what happens is that under freedom, competition always shows up. There's always competition. So let's, you can take many historical examples, but let's do the classics in America, right? Um, in 1870s, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Rockefeller had 93% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. Monopolist, right? No. Because a monopolist is not a monopolist unless they have government protection. Rockefeller had no government protection. So what did he do? What are we taught? An econ 101 would happen if somebody gains a monopoly. They raise prices. And they reduce quality because they don't care because they have no competition. But it isn't it weird that Rockefeller lowered prices every year, increased quality every year. Why? Well, partially, I mean, there are lots of reasons why. One is he realized that if he didn't, there would be competition because there were no barriers to entry. There are no political barriers to entry. People are always trying to chip away at a so-called monopolist. Second, He realized that as he lowered the price of oil, there would be more uses for it. So there would be, he would gain in economies of scale what he lost in profit margin. And of course, the reason we ultimately got the internal combustion engine with gasoline in it is because gas was so cheap. Who made it so cheap? Rockefeller. Also, when Rockefeller had 93% of the refining capacity in the United States, who ultimately competed him out of the business? Because the business that he was in was not oil. He was refining oil for what? What was he refining it for? It were no automobiles. Why did people need oil? For lighting. They used to burn kerosene lamps. Who competed him out of the lighting business? 100%. He lost his entire market share to Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Uh, uh, Thomas, Jefferson. Thomas Edison. <laughs> Thomas Edison, right? <laughs> to electricity. Now, who would have predicted that? What regulator in 1870 knew what was going to happen with electricity in the future? None. So there was competition that we didn't even know existed, what's called substitute products, a product that would completely substitute for oil. What's interesting is that if you take all that into account, Ultimately, Rockefeller's uh, business was broken up, right? Uh, In the 1920s, I think. By that point, he only had 23% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. Not because of government intervention, but because of competition. 
There's always competition in a free market. Now, you could the same thing happened to Alcoa, which had 80 something percent of the aluminum production. Same thing happened to IBM that had all mainframes. How many people have mainframes today? They were competed out of business, right? So it, the whole conception of monopolies is bogus, it's wrong. It comes from a, a, a complete uh, misunderstanding, a complete distortion of economics. There is no such thing as a monopoly in a free market. Monopolies are creatures of the state. They are granted special powers, they are protected. In a free market, if somebody has a lot of market share, that means they're being successful. That's all. Success is a good thing last time I looked. You want to be successful. Um, indeed, you could argue that there's a sense in which Apple is a, quote, monopoly. It's not really. Because Apple has become such a brand. Nobody else can sell Apple. Only Apple can sell Apple. And... But that's the whole point of starting a business. It's to gain so, to be so successful that nobody can compete with you on that which you are successful. In Apple's case, it's beautiful products and marketing. It's not iPhones. It's not computers. They're in the business of creating beautiful products and marketing them all. So yeah, beautiful and usable. That's the it's interesting we see we see the opposite happening when um, state companies are privatized right so you, you the best example that we have here in Brazil is Vali um, the iron ore company it used to be a state-owned company it, they had it was it was a defended by state monopoly what happened after they were privatized they become more lucrative what they pay in in dividends and taxes is more than what they um, gave to the state back in the day, which was negative in many cases. They increased the, the jobs uh, supplied there by a factor of 15 to 20. Their market value grew 15 to 20 to 30 times. So the, the other, the, the interesting thing is, which is, and I just, we discussed this a lot at the FBI too, is there's in Brazil, every single example of privatization has been the reduce of, of a monopolist sort of market and the increase of a capitalist you know, sector, industry, company, and the increase of dividends, taxes, jobs, etc. So we have no examples, not a single one of where privatization went wrong here. To the opposite, it's been it's been the other way around. It's been creating capitalism, creating free market, and creating space. So and everybody knows reflection. this. This is not a surprise. This should not surprise anybody. And yet these myths continued. True. Another, if you, I don't know how you're on time, but I think we have a couple more interesting questions here. Sure. Um, we, another, this is from one of our associates, Fernando. He, he asks if the disindustrialization process, right, um, and the impact on income, ge geographical distribution versus services oriented economy and finance and tech, et cetera. So, New York and Silicon Valley and, you know, Boston, et cetera. It, it's been happening for decades in the US, right? It's, it's something that's been happening independent of your perspective of it. Do you, the question from Fernando is, do you think that's contributed to the American shift to liberalism somehow into a more state-oriented um, culture or politics? I mean, it's, it's hard to tell because, of course, the, uh, the tech industry is very left-wing. It's very illiberal in many respects. Um, people who are in New York who are in the service businesses are very illiberal. Uh, indeed, I think most of America today, unfortunately, is very liberal. Um, no, I, I don't think so. You know, I de it, it, politics is not driven by economics in the long run. It's driven by ideas. Um, and look, deindustrialization is a good thing. Industrialization sucks. It's filthy. The jobs are not great. The, the hard work, physical labor. And the thing that has deindustrialized America is not China. What deindustrialized America is technology, uh, robots, computers. You just don't need that many people. Indeed, America, people don't know this, but America produces more stuff today than ever. But it produces it with less than half the people because of computers and robots and, 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 and technology. So the illiberalism is a consequence of ideas and the illiberalism
liberalism to a large extent is a consequence of the mixed economy. It's a consequence of a slow drift away from freedom and away from capitalism. And yet people feel alienated. They don't understand. They've always been promised that they will be successful and rich um, uh, no matter what. And nobody's ever demanded that they take personal responsibility for themselves. And they don't understand what's going on. Now they're being told that they're poor and they don't have anything. I mean, it's delusional. The, the, the working class and the lower middle class in America are rich relative to anybody else in the world. But they, they've been told by, again, intellectuals, they've been told a false story about stagnant wages and standard, stagnant standard of living. And as a consequence, they feel alienated and they have moved away from capitalism, not because capitalism betrayed them, but because the intellectuals betrayed them, because the intellectuals have told them that their problems are the fault of capitalism. This is why who your intellectuals are in a culture is everything, everything for the future, because the intellectuals tell the stories that the masses either endorse or rebel against, and they shape the future. And if you have bad intellectuals, the future is not good. And one thing to also reflect on, just to, to add on that, and just add my two cents here also, is if you look at what happened to wages, right, in the, you know, in industrial jobs, they, as Mises very easily and cleverly explained, is they went up because of tech, because of offer and demand, right? The general offer and demand of, of jobs, you know, there's more jobs, these jobs are paying more, so there's an there's a opportunity cost for that person to, you know, to leave. So if he's staying at, in this, we see this very clearly in the West, right? You know, labor jobs pay high in the U.S. versus anywhere in the world because just general wages are higher. And that yep. and people, I think, don't even perceive that tech is actually what brought their wages up, not inflation or Well, or wages go up when state. productivity goes up. And to the extent that technology exactly. increases productivity, wages go up. So every worker in the United States is a beneficiary of more technology, even though some of the jobs got lost. But look, a lot of the workers who lost their jobs in auto or steel, their children are working in Silicon Valley. Exactly. I remember Mises explains it through the butler example. You probably remember that, yeah. where yep. he mentions, you know, being a butler, there's no increase in productivity, yet productivity outside increases and, you know, your wage has to go up. There's a cost of opportunity. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Adam, just to walk towards the end here, we have some closing comments, but do you any, uh, I want to give you some space and the stage to give your final considerations if you have any on sort of democracy in the U.S. or this chat or democracy in Brazil. I'll leave this stage for you for, to wrap up. Sure. I mean, uh, the world is heading in a, in a very negative direction. It's heading in an illiberal direction. It's heading towards authoritarianism or one kind or another, left or right. In the end, it won't really matter to us who are stuck with the authoritarians uh, who, who, who want to control our lives. That is true in America. It is true in Brazil. It is certainly true in Europe. It is true everywhere. Um, and the only solution to it is a renewed vigor around liberty and around freedom that I think the classical liberals have. But what would I would encourage classical liberals to do, which I think they have not done enough of over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, is take Ayn Rand seriously. Ayn Rand is the solution to the problems that we have. Ayn Rand doesn't just present an economic answer, doesn't just present a, a moderate political answer, but she represents a real shift philosophically that can alter the culture. She presents us with a new way of looking at the world, a new way of evaluating reality and evaluating people and political systems and a new way of living your life as an individual. Uh, she emboldens you to take your life seriously, to, to challenge yourself to be the best human being you can be. And if people took Ayn Rand's idea of self-interest seriously, if they really wanted to be the best that they could be, if they really wanted to be successful at living, then there's only one political system that allows them to do that, and that is a system of freedom. That is a system of capitalism. So to bring about capitalism, we first need 
people who are self-interested enough to care about their own lives. We first need people who are committed to their own happiness and their own success at living. Um, so uh, I, I'm very, I, I get energized, as I said, when I come to Brazil and see how many people are, are reading Ayn Rand or studying Ayn Rand. I, I urge people to take it seriously, not just to read it because it's a good novel and get a few ideas here and there. Read her nonfiction, study her ideas, immerse yourself in her philosophical content and try to, in a sense, reshape your life based on these ideas. And if we can get enough people doing that, thinking that way, I think the world is ours. I don't think anybody can defeat us because reality is ours because, the, because we have the best ideas in the world. Uh, and it's just a matter of taking them seriously and living by them, which I think people need to embrace. Completely agree. Yeah, and I mean, I think one thing also to, to, to jump into our final comments here is you can never forget that the economy is nothing more than the sum of the productivity of individuals, right? Absolutely. We speak as, as, as we speak of inflation, we make this, you know, sort of word that's far from the reality of, you know, what the government is doing to, you know, with, with, um, with, with monetary policies. Um, we do the same with economy. We make it inhuman and unindividualistic and, and on, you know, it's, it's, it's far off. It seems something distant that we can control. It's the sum of the productivity of individuals. And if they have the right philosophy, the right mindset, the right perspective, the right foundations, the, 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 the sum of that should be, we expect it to be positive, right? And we've seen that. In Absolutely. It, it always is whenever we attempt it. We've never got it fully. We've never had the the ideal of capitalism, but we've gotten close. And every time we get close, good things happen. I, we should learn exactly. from history. Exactly. To wrap up and um, final minutes here, just to remind people, and I, I mentioned this to you before, Yada, we have our forum, um, our annual forum. It's our eighth forum coming up. It, I think it's an important event for people that are looking to go above, you know, beyond the obvious, beyond the surface and, and come into more profound conversations about freedom and philosophy and you know leadership and so on and that's going to be on the 17th of september um, the website for that is forumsp.org um, it's going to be online free online and paid in person um, and also just encourage people to follow both the Ireland's media and, and our media you know to continue this conversation this is what needs to happen <laughs> this is how we build the country we want to live in right in the future that we want to be in so, Yadam, uh, big thank you for your time. Big fan of your work and very inspiring to hear your words. Thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to visiting Brazil again, hopefully next year, and, and maybe, maybe attending one of your forums and, uh, uh, in the years to come and uh, meeting all of you in person. That, that, that will be a lot of fun. And hopefully, hopefully you can build a real movement in Brazil that, that brings about uh, real change. I mean, I, personally, I'd love to have a home in Rio de Janeiro and, uh, and, and and spend some time there. We know where. But we know first, where. you have to make it safe. You have to make it safe. Right? You know, we're doing our best. Aaron, thank, thanks a lot. Good time. My pleasure. And, and of it, course, it was, people, people can follow me on yourownbookshow.com and on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Just look up my name. Uh, sorry, I cut you off, Thomas. No, no, I was just going uh, to thank you. I really appreciate your time uh, and your effort to the Brazilian cause. Uh, we're in a dif difficult situation right now, but. We always uh, get out of it. Yes. <laughs> In a way or another. We yeah. haven't got out of it for 20 something years, but yes. we still intend to. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you, Yad. Yeah. Good Thanks, to have you guys. with us. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Have Take care, everybody. Bye bye.